uh, it's eerily similar, quite honestly. Somalia was overwhelmingly successful for about six months, and then as the insurgents started to become more active and they started to, to take advantage of their uncanny understanding of the power of the media and how to influence their own people, they began to undermine all this progress and start to make the people believe that we were not there to help them. We were there to take over their country. And a few other isolated incidents that occurred during the summer of 1993 f fueled that fire, and it became so extreme uh, that it ended in, in the things that we saw on October 3rd with regard to how they treated the remains of my crew and, and some of the other horrific things that occurred. Tell us about that day, October 3rd, and what your mission was when you left the base that day. We had done this mission six times before. It was basically to go into the city and apprehend people that were on a United Nations list. They, they were suspected insurgents, uh, members of the Klan that wanted the, the UN wanted to bring them in for questioning. So our mission was to go in and apprehend these people and then turn them over to the UN. To do that, you have to put troops on the ground who will then go into the building and identify these people, put them into custody, load them back on the helicopters, and then we go home. And we, as I said, we had done it six times, hadn't lost any helicopters, hadn't lost any, any uh, of our troops. This day, however, the cards were stacked against us somewhat. It was, uh, it was a daytime operation, which is never when we want to operate. It was in the worst part of town, very, very tight area, no places to land helicopters. So we couldn't get the troops out by air. They had to come out by ground. And the fact that we'd done it six times also went against us because, as we see today in Iraq, once the enemy begins to understand how we operate, where our vulnerabilities are, they take advantage of those weaknesses or vulnerabilities. So they knew how we were going to do this mission. And we, when we did it, they had developed a plan to try to counter our tactics. And uh, once the first Black Hawk went down, uh, that sent us into a spiral that lasted 17 hours. Did you see the first Black Hawk go down? I did not. I, I heard the call over the radio. I had already gone into the target and put all my rangers on the ground, and then I, I was I was the flight leader of my element, we call it. I had actually had uh, seven helicopters with me, and we went in. Uh, most of us put our troops on the ground, and then we, uh, we went back north of the city and waited in case we were needed for some other uh, piece of the mission. And I heard the call when Super 6-1 was hit uh, as, they, uh, as they went down. Michael Durant is my guest. He's a retired Chief Warrant Officer 4 and Black Hawk helicopter pilot. His book is called In the Company of Heroes. So what happened after that first helicopter went down? Well, it's the worst of all contingencies in an urban environment because now you have survivors most likely in a crash away from all of the friendly forces. So they're cut off and they're on their own, and that's exactly what the situation was here. There were survivors in the crash, and now the commander's got to worry about all the people fighting at the target, and now he's got another small battle, if you will, going on at the crash site. So he made the decision to have everyone move to the crash site because it's the immovable object in this scenario. Everything else can be moved but except for the crash site. So he directed everyone to consolidate there. In the meantime, we sent in another helicopter to put what we call a search and rescue force on the ground to treat the injured and, and try to provide some limited security in the, in the interim. And they were shot down. They made it back to the airfield, but they were shot down by a rocket propelled grenade as well. And then he called me and said that he wanted me to fly our aircraft back into the target to orbit the area and try to provide what we call fire support or supporting fires and shoot our weapons to help the ground force in their movement. You know, it's additional security from the air. Over the crash site? O uh, well, over the entire target area. Okay. So we went back in, and in about four minutes, were hit by yet another RPG. Now, how were you shot down? The, uh, the RPG, a rocket propelled grenade, is exactly what it's called. It's a, it's a very unsophisticated weapon. They've been around for a long time. There's lots of them in the world, unfortunately. And uh, it's a... Uh, not a huge warhead, but big enough that if it hits a helicopter in in, in any of the major areas, it, it'll cause significant damage. And it hit us just below the tail rotor, which is the small rotor on, on the back of a Blackhawk. And it ultimately caused that entire rotor to depart the aircraft. It disintegrated and, and came apart. 
that causes the aircraft to enter into a violent spin, and that's that's what happened. You know, we're hearing now that Al Qaeda might have been operating in Somalia back then in 1993. Do you have an opinion on that? There is evidence that suggests that was the case, and and I think uh, there's more than some. There's quite a bit of evidence that that leads to that, and it's logical because Al Qaeda existed at the time. We know now. We know that. They've always been gunning for us, if, if you will, and this was an opportunity for them to come help another organization that was fighting against the U.S. And what we forget is that al-Qaeda really got all their tactical training in Afghanistan fighting the Soviets. So a lot of what they knew, we taught them, and, and we taught them how to shoot down Russian helicopters. So they took those skills and brought them to Somalia is the theory. And once they came on the scene, uh, we started losing helicopters. I mean, we, we hadn't lost any for, for the whole time we were there. And then suddenly in a period of two weeks, we lost seven helicopters. Yeah, it doesn't seem to me obvious that if I want to shoot down a helicopter, then I would aim for the tail. You know, you would obviously aim for the for the body or for the pilot or for the people inside. It seems very sophisticated for them to be aiming for the tail, which is a very small part of the helicopter. Yeah, I'm still not sure they were actually aiming for the tail. It's possible. It's also possible that they their lead calculation wasn't enough, and they you know they were they were shooting in front of the aircraft, but because of its motion, by the time the 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 round actually got there, it hit us in the tail. It's in, there's an interesting story about pilots in Vietnam that actually painted targets on the belly of their helicopters. And the theory was you get the enemy to aim at the aircraft, and then the round ends up going behind the aircraft. So, you know, there's a, there's a lead angle calculation here that's required. I always thought that was a pretty interesting tactic that was employed back then. So you were, you were then hit, you crashed. What was the extent of your injuries at that time? It was a uh, very, very, very violent crash. The aircraft uh, fortunately landed on the wheels, but it, it came down at a high rate of speed, and uh, it snapped my femur in half, which is your thigh bone. My right femur cracked in two on the seat, and it crushed vertebrae in my spine and uh, knocked me unconscious. And then you came to immediately after that? I, you know, I, I can't really say for sure, but I would estimate it was about five minutes when I finally realized uh, you, you kind of come out of this syrupy fog, if you will. You, you, you're not sure what's going on. It's almost dreamlike. And then you, your, your brain starts to sort it all out and you realize, oh, okay, this is real. I, I'm, I'm now in the middle of yet another firefight and we're isolated, cut off, and, and surrounded. And there were three other people with you in the helicopter? Yes. What happened to them? We all survived the crash. The crew chiefs in the back had pretty severe injuries, even worse than mine, from what I could tell. But they were alive. The problem was we were all immobile. None of us could move, and I couldn't, I couldn't even get out of the aircraft. And uh, the crew chiefs, the, the two uh, soldiers in the back, they couldn't even move. Uh, Ray Frank, my co-pilot, was actually able to partially get himself out of the aircraft. And at about that point, these two incredibly courageous uh, Delta Force operators arrived at the side of, of the cockpit on, on my side, Gary Gordon and Randy Shugart. And initially, I thought this was a rescue force. I didn't realize that there were only two of them. How did they get there? They were actually dropped off by another Black Hawk that within minutes was also shot down. So it was, uh, it was intense at that point in, in, the, in the battle. Uh, but Randy and Gary had seen us from the air and, and insisted uh, via the radio that they be allowed to go in on the ground to try to provide some security for us until a larger force could arrive. And they finally got permission to do that and uh, for their actions were posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So you were taken out of the aircraft. You were being shot at by, um, I mean, was there a mob around the the helicopter? Not yet. I think the crash of the aircraft uh, scattered everyone initially because it came down like uh, like Dorothy's house in The Wizard of Oz, and uh, it, it caused everybody to take cover. I'm sure. So it was a a period of silence for maybe five or ten minutes right after we hit the ground, and then uh, after Gary and Randy arrived, that's when the Somalis were trying to get back in to the site, and uh, and that's when the shooting started up again. And you also were able to, to shoot even though you're immobile? 
Right. They put me on. The, they took me out of the cockpit, put me on the right side, uh, laying uh, with my back uh, to the rear of the aircraft. 